And I want to talk about a, a side project um, that has nothing to do whatsoever with what I normally do. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful collaboration between a uh, philosopher of science, James DeFrisco, a mathematician, Nick Monk, and myself, uh, that took us to ask the question, what are dynamical systems based on? And uh, the basic motivation to ask this question is that it's very difficult to think uh, about the universe as sort of uh, processes happening instead of things. So the, the basic constituents of the, the, the world that we live in, uh, we usually take them as things. This is something that, that develops very early in development. What you see here is this wonderful uh, montage of, of uh, two pictures of the Eiffel Tower. And you immediately focus in on the constant, uh, the Eiffel Tower, while everything around it has changed completely in the intervening years. So it's completely clear to us that change is universal. Everything changes at more or less uh, uh, long time scales. But we generally tend to explain the world in terms of static entities. And uh, this substance-based uh, sort of view is really deeply entrenched in our thinking. It starts, there's some evidence uh, from developmental psychology that uh, we are substance thinkers from the age of, of, of one when we start to, to think in concepts, basically. So there's a, a sort of a really obvious discrepancy between what, how the world really is and, and how we sort of try to think about it. And uh, so one reason for that, um, well, here is, is first of all to, to, to uh, illustrate what kind of problems you can get from that. If you're a geneticist, we tend to explain behavioral traits and other traits by genes, which is sort of a weird thing to do because you uh, assign uh, to a thing a sort of a function, right? So this was this is an exa old example. There was an actual craze in the end of the 90s about uh, a gene that people were uh, thinking was, was um, responsible for a particular behavior, uh, the gay gene, it was called in a, in a New York Times headline. And uh, it's not just absurd to believe that there's one gene for this sort of a very complicated developmental and behavioral trait, but it's also, uh, it's completely absurd to think uh, that this is an explanation at all, right? There's some, some sort of error here. You have a thing explaining a process. So you have to imply that that uh, thing has agency. And that's sort of a, a really big problem. So how do genes act? And we, we've spent the last 30 years, 40 years trying to figure that out, maybe 50 years already. So uh, it would probably be more accurate to explicitly refer to the world as a collection of processes, okay? So, so I'm a big fan of process thinking, but it, it's, it's sort of a, a, a very, very complicated task. I mean, let me first um, define what I mean by process thinking here. Process metaphysics as a general line of approach holds that physical existence is at bottom processual. The processes rather than things best represent the phenomena that we encounter in the natural world, if you look really closely. So this is really trivial. Yeah? It's so trivial that we usually don't uh, recognize it as a problem. But it's re really, really hard to actually do this. Uh, and only few philosophers in, in the history of philosophy have, have really seriously tackled this. One is Heraclitus, the father uh, of, of process philosophy and the founder of this tradition. Um, and he's often depicted as uh, the weeping philosopher here. And that's probably because he tried to explain process thinking to people in ancient Greece and didn't, didn't get very far. His writings are incredibly obscure. Um, uh, Roberto, who's sitting in the back, has, has made a Twitter bot that uh, randomly tweets fragments of, of Heraclitus uh, thinking. So, so Google Heraclitus bot and you get very sort of cryptic uh, little, little fragments of his work. Much more well known is, uh, of course, Leibniz. Uh, who together with uh, uh, Newton will, will uh, feature very prominently in this talk, who was a, a process philosopher. Uh, Bergson in France, he has a bad rap with biologists because he was a, a vitalist, but he actually had some really interesting things to say about processes and, and evolutionary processes in, in, in particular. Um, not well known in, in Europe, uh, the American pragmatists, uh, James, Peirce, and, and Dewey, uh, very much underrated philosopher, but the, the sort of really big figure in this tradition 
is Alfred North Whitehead. And I will not refer to him much, uh, but he's really sort of the, the most important modern process thinker. You can see um, there are a bunch of uh, uh, people that I want to mention here that are active today. You can see there is a very, it's, there's, it's an active tradition, but a very small tradition. If I can put them on one slide, there's not a lot of philosophers that, that have thought about the world in this way. And um, that is a problem if, if you sort of uh, realize that everything is really a process. Okay, to make this argument a bit more strongly, Johanna Seidt uh, has a, a, a wonderful paper that uh, is called The Myth of Substance and the Fallacy of Misplaced Concreteness. So let me parse that for you. Okay, her argument is that processes explain more than things because there are processes that are not bound to a, 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 an object or a subject. So these are subjectless subject activities. And her example that I'm using here is snowing. So this is a process, we can identify it, we can distinguish it from other processes like raining. It has a spatial location and temporal location, but it's not very well defined. But the, what it, who is doing, what is doing the snowing? There are snowflakes, but they're not doing the snowing. They're just sort of uh, parts of what, you know, of the snow. So there is no agency, no central agent behind this sort of process. And the argument uh, uh, is very simple. So if there are phenomena in the world, there are processes that are subjectless, there are no uh, objects that are not involved in processes. Otherwise you don't, you can't perceive them. So therefore, process thinking has more explanatory power uh, than substance-based thinking. Therefore, it is better in a way, than substance-based thinking. In this, in this sort of, in terms of its explanatory power. That's the argument that is being made here. And even more strongly, uh, uh, Seid says, uh, substances, the myth of substance is, uh, a, a, substances are just an abstraction. Uh, and that's uh, based on this fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Sometimes we take something uh, for real that is not really real. Okay, so we perceive objects in our world, we can possess them, we can uh, delimit them very easily. Um, but in, in reality, um, these, these are just slowly changing processes. The chair you're sitting on um, was actually fixed today. There were quite a few broken chairs. So that, that shows you how these sort of apparent objects are also uh, processes, but they're just changing at a much uh, slower time scale than you, you uh, tend to care about during this lecture. Okay, so a strong sort of claim. Process uh, metaphysics is, is, has more, has a bigger explanatory power than thinking about the world in terms of, of, of things. Um, so why isn't, isn't everybody using it then, right? Why, why aren't we educating our children to think in terms of process rather than, than things? And um, well, that is a good question. And the reason is the following. So here, is a sort of a definition that you get from a standard work, um, Rescher's process metaphysics on what a process is. He says, a process is a coordinated group of changes in the complexion of reality, an organized family of occurrences that are systematically linked to one another, either causally or functionally. I don't understand this, okay? And this is one of the, the sort of most concise, clearest definitions that you can find in the literature of what a process is. We have no idea what processes are. It's very hard to put what a process is in, in words because our uh, deepest logical structures in our brain are, are used to think uh, about things. What is a coordinate group, coordinated group? Changes, isn't that change? Isn't that a sort of a, what a process is? So isn't that a tautological, uh, tautological definition? What is the complexion of reality? I don't know. I have no idea. An organized family of, what are occurrences? Aren't occurrences things if processes are made of occurrences? Um, how are they systematically linked to one another? What is causality? What is function? So this leaves a lot to be desired, right? And this is a general problem. Um, there are two problems with process thinking. One is that it's really hard to actually think uh, about process directly. The other one is that we don't know what a process is, okay? So this talk will, will sort of try and address uh, what we mean by a process. So this is a, a talk in ontology, metaphysics, which is sort of uh, the science of what is really real. 
and what we have to base our knowledge on about the world. Okay? So it's not science, it's philosophy. I'm presenting you a particular argument about how you can base your thinking uh, about processes uh, more rigorously than, than this sort of um, quote. And to illustrate the, the problem, I want to um, use the classic sort of problem of Zeno's arrow, okay? Who, knows, who doesn't know the, the arrow paradox here in the room? So uh, Zeno had a few paradoxes somewhere about space. This one is about time. So you have an archer shooting an arrow at a target. And if you look at how the, the arrow is moving at a certain time interval, it will have covered a certain distance. Let's say half of the distance to the target. And then you can, you can actually half the half distance and so on and so forth. And at the end of this sort of division into smaller and smaller units, you get to what we call an instant of time. So this is what we think time is made of, or a little uh, durationless instance, right? And so Zeno pointed out uh, two problems with this, this view of time. One is that if you can divide time in infinitely, the arrow will never reach the target because it has to uh, uh, cross an infinite amount of, of, uh, uh, of time intervals. So how does that work? You cannot... It's not possible in finite time. The second sort of problem is that if you look at the arrow at any one instance, of course, it's not moving. Okay? So how can you get movement out of this uh, sort of apparent uh, paradox that you, know, you have an infinite amount of not moving arrows making up the trajectory of the arrow? So one interpretation of this problem is that you could think about reality as if it was a, a movie with frames. Um, that, um, well, I'm not going to spend much time on this sort of view because it's, it's first of all, it's completely in incompatible with any process thinking. There are some other problems. Uh, first of all, at any one of these, in any one of these frames, the, the arrow is not moving. So, for example, if the arrow, an arrow that is moving to the right or an arrow to the, that is moving to the left is in the same state. So this gives you a problem of the future not being determined anymore because you don't know where the, the arrow is going. And uh, the biggest problem is how do you connect those frames? Nicolas Malbranche, a uh, French philosopher, thought that God reinvented the universe at every, every moment, every infinite moment in time. So God must be a very busy person. So this is not a very sort of reasonable uh, view of the world. So let's not think about that too much. The solution, one solution to the problem, is that you, uh, you state that each instant not only has a state, so there's a position of the arrow, but there's some sort of magic vector called impetus associated with the arrow that uh, indicates its, its the future direction, okay? And that arrow is a fundamental um, part of what the universe is. The problem with this view is that it immediately, it's twice as complex as this because it requires twice the variables to describe. Um, but uh, this view takes you a long way, for example, um, it is the view that Newton and Leibniz used to base uh, their differential calculus on. And, and basically, uh, the calculus, or as Newton called it, the doctrine of flux, is supposed to solve Zeno's paradox. So at each moment, you have an instantaneous velocity associated with the arrow that tells it where it's going to go next. Okay? And that sort of instantaneous uh, movement, it's not really movement because it's instantaneous, but it's supposed to be real in some way. Okay, and it's very useful for, for differential calculus to actually uh, uh, calculate the, the trajectory of the arrow. But what we're interested uh, in here is ontology. Is it really real, this sort of instantaneous rate of change or instantaneous velocity? So what I want to do during this talk is um, I want to convince you that uh, this view doesn't solve the problem at all. Okay, and I want to use uh, three independent, mathematically grounded arguments to demonstrate uh, the point. One is uh, dynamical systems theory, the idea of, of change in dynamical systems theory. The second one is, uh, is what's actually new in this talk and in this argument is an argument from general systems theory. And the last one uh, is from the intuitionist philosophy of time. Okay, so three parts. 
you've probably heard of this. You probably don't, haven't heard of these two. Um, so uh, I'm going to present this in a very sort of hopefully intuitive way. If it's too formulaic or you don't understand, please interrupt me or if I'm going too fast, because it's a sort of an argument that goes step by step. And if you lose me, it doesn't, it's not going to make much sense anymore to you. OK. So let's start uh, and look at what is change in dynamical systems theory. Dynamical systems theory goes back to Newton's and Leibniz's differential calculus, of course, uh, and it is the theory that we use to describe processes nowadays. Uh, dynamical systems are processes. And so uh, let me introduce a very simple dynamical system. Uh, that's a pendulum. And what I want to do is I want to, just by observing the pendulum, derive the idea of what change is in this system. OK? So how does this system change over time? A pendulum is represented by, by some sort of rod with a certain length. Uh, there is a weight at the end of the rod, and it, it swings back and forth uh, to a certain angle. And you can characterize this. You can, you can look at the pendulum, and you can say, OK, uh, the, the, the bob of the pendulum is always at a certain position, and it has a certain velocity. You can measure both of those uh, magnitudes. OK, you, you can obviously observe where the position is, but you can measure, measure the velocity by bumping uh, the pendulum into a wall and measure the force that it exerts on that wall. So at this point, this is the starting point. Uh, it's at maximum uh, displacement, no velocity. Here's the next point, and so on. So this is one way to represent the system. We can compact that. Um, there was one more time point that I expected. Um, we can compact that and plot the velocity against the position. So I'm just introducing this way of really efficiently uh, depicting the system, the behavior of the system. So instead of plotting time explicitly, we just uh, plot where uh, and when uh, and how fast uh, the pendulum is moving at any given time in this uh, plane, which is called the phase plane of the system. OK, so this is a, a reflection of the impetus view that says both uh, the, the, the change and the position of the system, the state of the system, are fundamental properties of the system. If you don't see it where I'm going, I hope to make it clear in a little bit more. Um, time. So this is a sort of a very, very compressed way of, of depicting it. And now you can start varying you know, the amount that you swing the pendulum, the, the velocity of the pendulum. And if you, if you plot all the possible combinations of veloci velocity and, and positions, you get what's called the face portrait of the system, which is nothing but sort of this, this circle is here in the middle. And then if you swing the pendulum too hard, it will actually get to the top. So you, you, you assuming that the, the rod is actually solid, it will stop there and then go on. And if you sw uh, swing it even harder, it'll start going around like this, OK? So the, the, the sort of picture, the face portrait you're seeing here is just a summary of the, all the possible behaviors of the pendulum. And I, I need to make two observations here. One is that we have derived this without any math, no equations. This is just drawn from observations. There is no mathematical tricks involved here. Uh, and uh, the second observation is that uh, in, if you look at the pendulum as a dynamical system, the pendulum is what the pendulum does. We're not interested in what is it made of, how, how long is the rod or whatever. We're just interested in, in describing um, what it does. And that is done by uh, drawing these arrows, which is called the flux of the system. And the flux is a mathematical representation of how this uh, system changes over time. Is that sort of, is that okay? So in dynamic, if you're a dynamical system, systems person, you're not interested in what the pendulum looks like. You're just interested in what it does. And you can now start uh, to introduce some mathematical notation. So now we want to, to mathematically describe how these trajectories look like. So one way to go about it, and this was the traditional way, is to describe each one of those curves separately. So you can uh, introduce uh, a curve phi that depends on position, velocity, x, y, and also, of course, on time, okay? 
But the problem with this formalism, don't worry about the mathematical details here, is that you have to, so this is an example for the circle that I've highlighted here. Uh, this is uh, uh, an explicit example that includes time. You have to do this, this whole complicated procedure for every trajectory independently, okay? This is a very clumsy way of describing the system and you're never gonna get anywhere uh, with this. So Newton and Leibniz introduced uh, a very simple trick. They replaced the observable, measurable velocity of the system and said what velocity is, it's just a rate of change in position. So this is no longer an observable, but it is derived mathematically. It's called a derivative, uh, okay? So this is an instantaneous rate of change, like the, the, the arrows that in the impetus view that I was showing you before. And this is a very simple trick. It changes the description of the system uh, from an explicit description of each curve separately to a differential equation. All you need to know about this switch is that this allows you to describe the, the pendulum with one equation, basically, instead of infinite numbers of equations. So it's a very powerful uh, mathematical formalism. And at the same time, as we have seen, if you assume this is real, it sort of seems to solve Zeno's paradox um, of how the arrow gets from one moment to the other. Does that make sense? Okay. So, is this really as innocent as it looks? Let's have a look at it. What is an instantaneous rate of change? What is a derivative in mathematical terms? It's defined as an infinitesimal limit. So what you're doing basically to get to the number uh, of that rate is you take a certain uh, interval over time and you see how far the pendulum has moved. And then you shrink that interval of time infinitely small and then you get in the limit of infinity for an infinitely small interval you get an instantaneous rate of change. Now from this picture it should be immediately clear to you this, that this hasn't solved Zeno par Zeno's paradox, but this is Zeno's paradox in mathematical form. So uh, differential calculus, this is not an argument that's new, that's been made before, that um, it doesn't really solve Zeno's paradox at all. And if you're interested not just in calculating the trajectory of the, the arrow, the sort of shut up and calculate school of, of uh, um, differential calculus, if you're interested in if, if whether these instants, whether these velocities are real, then there, there is still the problem um, that the arrow has to transfer, uh, traverse an infinite number of, of time intervals to get to the target, and that it's not moving at any one instant. So the basic bottom line is here, you need finite time intervals to determine an instantaneous rate of change. So you need to measure the displacement of the pendulum over finite intervals and then shrink those intervals to be able to actually determine an instantaneous rate of change. So it seems like that instantaneous rate of change is really just an abstraction. And I'm gonna come back to that in each one of those arguments. So this seems to tell us that to understand change, we need to look uh, over a, a, a sort of a, a duration of time. We cannot abstract time away uh, to understand change, okay? But it's sort of weak, it's a weak argument. So, and this is the original contribution uh, that I am making to this argument. It's a second line of argument. There's a very obscure book from the 1970s, um, which is a foundational book in systems biology. So this is a bit weird. Why would I bring this up here? It's Mazarovich and Takahara's book called uh, General Systems Theory. Uh, here it is. It's cited by a lot of people. It's one of these books, like Rene Thom's book about um, structural stability and morphogenesis that a lot of people cite, and I bet nobody's actually read it because it's really hard to understand. So what they do in this book is they use a, a mathematical approach called category theory to derive uh, the idea of a dynamical system from the most abstract idea of a system that you could possibly have, okay? So this is the core of this talk, and it's gonna be a little, little technical, but I hope I can explain it. Um, so the general, the, the, the basic idea is that you take the most general abstract representation of, of a system that you think of, and then you uh, try to derive 
a dynamical system like the pendulum I was, I was showing you before from that very abstract notion. So you put more and more conditions on it to say if uh, this system is to be a dynamical system, then it has to fulfill these and these conditions. Okay, so that's the general approach. So the most general idea that they could come up with uh, what a system is, is you have a number of mathematical objects. So these are not real world objects like in substance based philosophy. Mathematical objects are variables, for example, okay? And they are somehow connected to each other. So the most abstract definition of a system is it's some sort of relation between a subset of those variables that you have. There's some sort of relation. It can be between multiple uh, objects and it can include the same object twice, okay? So this is a, a system is in some ways uh, a bunch of relationships between variables. So that's a mathematician's most abstracted idea of a system. And their idea in the book is to sort of lay uh, the basis of a, of a general theory of, of systems in biology. But they have these two chapters at the beginning where they derive what the dynamical system is from this very abstract notion that is very interesting if you're interested in the notion of time and change. So we can go a step further now. It's not very helpful, this definition. And uh, we can focus on uh, input-output or stimulus-response systems. In, this, in these systems, you have an input object and an output object, and you have some sort of specific values of those objects in there. And there is some sort of relation between the two. The, the values that we are looking at are drawn from, from a, a, a sort of a bigger alphabet of possible values. And these uh, values in, in the objects are somehow related. Okay, so that's a more explicit sort of uh, uh, depiction of this very general idea of a system. It's very abstract. Don't imagine too much what this is. It's just a bunch of relations. It's a mathematical way to define a bunch of relations between objects, mathematical objects, which are variables. So if we restrict ourselves uh, a little further, we can say that every system that actually exists has to be extended in time. If it doesn't extend in time, it's not actually there. Does that make sense? So th those systems that extend in time are time systems. And you can now have relations uh, between the objects that differ through time. So if we start on the timeline on the left side, you have a, a certain set of interactions here and certain set of values in a later time, different sets, and so on and so forth. Now, there doesn't need to be any relation between the, the, any connection between the relations at different time points. And this is the most general sort of mathematical description that you could come up with uh, to formalize the idea of a process. Okay, so this is where, where the mathematics is supposed to help us understand better what change means and time means. Is that, does that make any, any sort of sense at all? So um, if we cannot perceive a certain regularity or a pattern in a process, it's not an interesting system to study, right? So the next step is to say, okay, what we have is there is a formalizable relation first between the input and the output um, object and then also through time. We come back to that later. So uh, we are saying in a, in a sort of formalized mathematical way, you would say there's a function mapping the input to the output. This is also called a morphism, but morphism is just a fancy word for, for a mathematical function. Or I'm going to use the term mapping. Okay, so there, there's some sort of relation between those two objects, and it's not random. It is, you can summarize it as a mathematical function. And so it exhibits a certain uh, regularity, and, and this only function type systems are interesting to study. Uh, general time systems are mostly just random. And we're only one step away now from, from what uh, dynamical systems are. Okay, so dynamical systems are function type time systems that are consistent and realizable. So this whole argument is, is, is formulated as an explicit uh, series of proofs in the book. I'm gonna spare, <laughs> spare you that today, but I'm, uh, I, I recommend you do like me and you spend two, uh, we, uh, two months of your summer time when you don't have anything else to do and, tr and try to parse the, the, the mathematical formalism there. So I'm going to try and, and sort of um, 
translate that for you and uh, make an argument of what consistent and realizable is. Okay, before we can do that, we need to introduce a function and also a, a new sort of idea. So the consistency of a system is given by what's called the global response function of the system. So now you not only have an input and an output, but uh, you introduce this notion of a system state. And the system state is sort of an abstract uh, attri internal attribute of the system uh, that summarizes the result of past inputs and activities. Okay. So in this sort of view, the state, remember the state of the pendulum was the position and it was an observable. Here, the state is derived or introduced through the mathematical formalism as something that is supposed to help you understand this mapping of input to output. So this is a completely relational approach, which is very closely related to uh, process thinking. You're not thinking in terms of things, you're thinking in terms of uh, uh, relations. Does that make sense? A system is consistent if its state properly connects past history and future of the system. There's some mathematical formalism to show this, but there has to be a, a past leading up to the present state. And from that present state, you have to get to the future of the system uh, in a way uh, that is basically connected through the state. So the current state is a sort of an abstract idea that connects the past and the future. And that, and they introduced this term here, is, is what they call consistency of the system. So consistency is a property that connects the past and the future. This is, is called realizability. Uh, a system is realizable if there's a second uh, set of uh, functions called a state transition function, which then connects the state at time t via some input that the, the system re uh, receives to a state at time t prime in the future. So basically, the state transition function is a necessary component of a dynamical system that you need to connect one time to the next. So the previous, the response function was about connecting input with output, uh, past input with future output. This is about connecting uh, states over time. Okay, for a system to be realizable, the state transition function must connect the different response functions at different times through the system state. So you need two ingredients for the dynamical system. One is a relationship between the input and the output, and the other one is a sort of a consistent relationship through time. So we've just introduced the notion of a state. So the state is instantaneous at the present. Okay, and there is the state sort of abstracts away from time. It sort of uh, represents uh, past inputs and activities. And then, if you take that state and the current input, you have to have a consistent mapping to an output. That's what consistency means. Yeah, I explained how, it in a bad way. How can you have a notion of past state if you don't have a notion of time? So that is all compacted into... The state is introduced as something that represents the past, but is, is at the present instant. Okay. Yeah? Yes. Okay, so there's a whole, of ma a whole mathematical argument be behind that. Um, so there's, there's different aspects of, uh, of that. So you have to have a mathematical proof that shows that there is a history leading up to a particular state, et cetera, et cetera. There's other aspects. There is the, the aspect um, of, of how it mingles with the input. And so there's different, uh, there, there's a proper, a proper mathematical definition of proper in the book, but I don't want to go into this right now because I, I would torture you with too much uh, category theory here. So the order is given by the state transition function. And so the, the state transition function not only connects uh, state from any, inter so it connects the state A at any time T to any other time T prime. So this is derived in the book from uh, the sort of idea, what uh, do you need for the system to be consistent? So to have a consistent mapping from input to output and realizable to be able to propagate that 
relationship through time. So this is your starting point. And then you derive the formalism uh, and the state is the only sort of, you introduce this notion of a state which happens at an, an, an instant. I'm going to come back to that problem later on. So it, I'm not explaining this very well, but I hope. So these sort of families of functions, I'm not showing you the equations here, but maybe I should have. These are uh, infinite uh, series sets of equations because there is an infinite number of, of, um, of possible intervals. And uh, what's really important here is, is uh, the, the abstraction. That this, what I, these blobs I'm showing you here are an infinite family uh, of, of state transition functions that need to connect any state t to any other state t prime in the interval over which the system exists. I don't know if that's helpful. The category you start with are the function uh, type systems. And to get the properties that you need to have a system that corresponds to a dynamical system, as in dynamical systems theory, so are these two constraints. And so you define the category of dynamical systems from the category of function type systems by imposing those two types of constraints. Of, of consistency and realizability. So I hope that is that. Mm -hmm. and, and you use category theory uh, to A, uh, show the relation between those two um, as, as one being a subset of the other, and also uh, to show that this category of systems has the properties you want from a dynamical system as defined by the much older dynamical systems theory. So this category of dynamical system involve, includes anything you can formulate uh, with a rule-based rule uh, formalism or a differential equa uh, equation-based formalism. So all the dynamical systems that we use in physics and biology fall into this category. Um, and again, there's a formal argument in the book uh, that I'm inviting you to re treat yourself to uh, uh, about that. So the, the combination of uh, state transition and uh, response function is called uh, the dynamical representation of the system. So let's introduce one more constraint. I'm, I'm almost through, You've al you're almost there. Um, so we're interested in systems that are causal. So we're gonna re restrict we're going to say the output of a causal system only depends on the current state and past input. So it's, uh, there is no instantaneous uh, action allowed. Okay? So it takes some time from the input to get to the output. Okay? These systems are called non-anticipatory systems. And for these systems, uh, basically, we can dissect their, their dynamics into two steps. So there's the state transition function state A, state B, there's some sort of input you get from one to the other, and there's an output function. Once you've done this, uh, you map to the output. And you can use category theory again to show that only for such causal dynamical systems can you completely separate these two as aspects of the, of the system. Okay? So if you're interested in the problem of change, you don't have to worry. Uh, this is called the canonical representation of the system. And if you're interested in the problem of change, it's all in here. So you can ignore all the compl uh, complexities of the relation between the input and the output. Is anyone still with me here? <laughs> so uh, if we want to understand what change really means, we have to look at the properties of this state transition function. So the idea is to, to clarify the concept of change through the mathematical notation introduced here. Okay, let's see if we can get something out of that. And so this is a general notion of flow, of change. Okay, but it's much broader than a uh, typical dynamical system. So you can have uh, different variable, you know, the dimensionality of, 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 your uh, of your state space can change. It can be a time variant system. It can be stochastic. This is not about observation. There is a whole theory on top of the, this that connects it to observables. But this is purely theoretical, a purely abstract uh, ca category theory <laughs> argument that is trying to get at the fundamental uh, properties uh, of the, the cate uh, category of dynamical systems.
And then on top of that, there is a, a realization, there's whole books again on realization theory that I didn't treat myself to that uh, show you how these are, are, you know, how you connect observables and so on and so forth. I'm just deriving two very, very, very basic insights from this. One is that without a state transition function, you are not getting a dynamical system. So there is no dynamical system without a, a, a connection of states through time. And this function, by definition, is always extended over a certain interval. You cannot reduce this to an instant. Okay, it's impossible. So if you could reduce this to an instant, this would no longer be a dynamical system. Yeah. So this provides a sort of an independent argument that A, change is fundamental, so process is fundamental, and it always has to extend over time. So you cannot think about change. So Zeno is right. You cannot think about the arrow at any instant. It's not moving. Okay, so that's basically just a mathematization uh, derived from a, a, a totally different angle. Remember, the pendulum we derived from observations, the, the same conclusions we now derived from completely the opposite end, a completely abstract theory of systems. Okay, and you end, end up at the same point. If you have two independent sort of derivations of something, uh, Bill Wimsett tells us that the insight is, is already a bit more robust than it's if, if, if you're only deriving it from one, one way. Okay, the third part is much shorter. Is everybody still happy? So uh, it's, it's very, very simple. The message is simple. You, you cannot have a dynamical system um, without a state transition function, and the state transition function is always extended in time. So this is really cool. I only discovered uh, the intuitionist approach uh, to mathematics and time through this project. Uh, and uh, one of the most prominent uh, uh, philosophers involved in this is Michael Dummett. I'm going to use one of his arguments, this is no longer my argument, to use a third way of, of making you think about uh, time as a sort of a, an infinite series of instants. So what is intuitionist uh, mathematics, intuitionist philosophy of time? Let's get back to, to Zeno's arrow paradox. So we've seen now that the, the at-at theory we had sort of ruled out very early in the argument now shown that impetus theory is just a cheap trick. It's sort of uh, an abstraction. So if you're interested in the ontology of change, it doesn't really help you understand change. So the only conclusion that is, is left uh, is that there are no instants. Instants don't exist. And this is sort of really uh, counterintuitive because we usually think that the present is all there is. And the present is an instant, right? The past is no longer and the future is not yet. And this uh, gives you a bit of a problem. Actually, this was the first insight that Aristotle had when he was criticizing Zeno's paradox. He said, oh, but the problem is not a problem because uh, there are no instants. And then he goes on and writes, this is crazy. And then he goes and writes about uh, 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 impetus theory and ad, ad theory. I mean, not in those words, but... Uh, so he dismisses this as completely crazy. This, this cannot be. So, but it's the only thing we have left. So we have to think about time as consisting of moments. And moments are extended over time. You cannot reduce time to instantaneous, uh, uh, well, to instant. So think about when, when we learn about time in school and when we use mathematics and dynamical systems theory, we repre represent time as the line of real numbers. Okay, and here is where the intuition part of intuitionist mathematics comes in. So real numbers have a really, some really weird properties. So the argument here, the intuitionist argument goes that physical quantities, that's what we're interested in, they must have a determinate magnitude, right? I mean, if you believe in, in a determinacy in the universe, um, it would not be good if, you know, you couldn't sort of determine the temperature right now. Well, that's already a problem, right? Or the length of a, a measure or something like that. Um, but what does that mean to have a determinant magnitude? It means, for, in, for, for the timeline, it means uh, the times that you can determine 
are only the rational numbers here, the ones that are representable by a fraction. The irrational numbers, so durationless instants are represented by uh, rational and irrational numbers. The irrational numbers are those that you cannot represent by a fraction. They are represented by an infinitely long decimal notation. Okay, So you cannot determine them because to calculate them, you need an infinite amount of time. So most real numbers are not determinable. Okay, so pi, for example, is an irrational number. And you cannot measure, you cannot determine the exact magnitude of pi. Okay, because it never ends, the, the decimals never end. Okay, then the second problem comes in. Real irrational numbers, real numbers are densely ordered. So any num so this is really bizarre if you've ever thought about this for five minutes. None of the real numbers on this line have a neighbor. It's really weird because you can always insert another number between the two numbers ad infinitum, okay? And this is getting us back to Zeno's paradox, of course. This is really bizarre. Zeno had a really good point. If you don't have, if two instants cannot be next to each other, how the hell can the, the arrow get from one to the next? There's always one in between, and that's exactly Zeno's paradox again. So we come at Zeno's paradox from a completely different angle, which says, so intu intuitionist mathemat uh, mathematics, the intuitionist representation of mathematics basically has a problem with what they call actual infinities. They say infinities are cool if you're a mathematician, but infinities don't actually exist, cannot actually exist in the universe because they are not determinate. In this very general sense of not being even in principle measurable. Okay, and it's a, it's a sort of a general argument about uh, realism and anti-realism here if you're philosophically inclined. Okay, but just, just looking at this num uh, line of numbers, you can say it's a completely abstract representation of time. It cannot be real. So instead, we have to assume, if we're interested in what's real, we're interested in metaphysics of time, you have to assume that time consists of what Dummett calls constitutive intervals. So now you can call the bullshit on me because, of course, what about those, those, uh, those boundaries of the, the interval? Well, you know, uh, these intervals are all, all open. They never reach the boundary, really. So they are, again, these instants only exist as an infinite limit of the interval getting close to its boundary. Okay? So these are open intervals. They don't include the boundary points. So it's a bit like a fuzzy window sliding along time, if you want. And time on this model, Dummett writes, is not composed of durationless instants, but of densely ordered overlapping intervals having some temporal extension. Densely ordered. There is an infinite number of these intervals. This is, I mean, I still get a little dizzy when I think about it. And it's a very simple simple argument. And he writes beautifully. You don't have to understand anything about mathematics to understand his paper. So there's an infinite number of, of possible intervals. Note that these are not quanta. You cannot chop up time. You can chop up time infinitely because there's an infinite number of these intervals that overlap. Okay, so it's smooth. Time is continuous, but there are no instants and change happens within uh, any one of those intervals, in fact, change is defined, these intervals are defined by some sort of process in the universe changing at a certain time scale, okay? So uh, it depends, how you choose those intervals depends on what you're looking at. And in the paper, Dummett even derives sort of minimal, um, you know, for different processes, he, he derives what the minimum possible uh, sizes of these intervals, but there is a minimum possible size. So coming out of this, we go back to Aristotle and we can say time is nothing but the measure of change. So in this sense, all that's real are processes that are occurring in the universe and they give us time. We, time is again an abstraction that we use to measure the amount of that change and the constitutive intervals represent change in magnitude of different quantities over time that are determinate quantities. So I'm hoping that by, by 
making three arguments that don't make sense on their own, you get <laughs> sort of a, uh, that, that I can convince you that. that. So again, um, this, this uh, converges to, to, to the conclusion that Henri Bergson is present, uh, presenting here. What precisely is the present? If it is a question, I love the hat, by the way, uh, and the mustache. If it is a question of the present instant, I mean of a mathematical instant, which would be of, uh, to time what the mathematical point is to the line, it is clear that such an instant is a pure abstraction, an aspect of the mind. It only exists in our head. It cannot have real existence. And so Dummett's argument is an argument um, for the reality of what, what Bergson calls pure duration. But if you read Bergson's book, I've tried to understand what pure duration is. It's really hard. So Dummett sort of makes it much clearer uh, through his mathematical argument. OK, I'm almost done. The problem, of course, is that I was, for example, the general systems theory um, approach is all defined by mappings. It's all about mappings. But a mathematical mapping is from one point, one state, to another state. So these states are points. They happen at an instance. And so you can call uh, bullshit on me again and say, hey, you know, you've, you've used an argument that is based on the assumption of an instant to prove that there are no instants. Okay, so that's a, that's a bit of a, a troublesome um, sort of aspect of the whole argument. Now, uh, there is something that is wonderfully called pointless geometry. I'll, I'll uh, tell you in a minute. It was invented as point free geometry, but there's a wonderful review that's called pointless geometries. And they're truly pointless because, um, first of all, the funny thing is they go back uh, to work that Whitehead did on process philosophy. Okay, so they're actually a really, this type of geometry is a, is a, uh, a product of, of process thinking. So normally we define a function in mathematics from one point to another point, and points are abstractions, if you believe my argument. But you can formulate, uh, in pointless geometry, you formulate a mapping uh, as an infinite number of relations between open intervals. And so you have a, a formalism that is very complicated to handle that maps from open region to open region. So you can, you can describe the, the timeline as it really is using pointless geometry. But it's truly pointless because in this paper called Pointless Geometry, they show that it's, uh, these two geometries are homeomorphic. So you will get qualitatively the same results if you abstract and you use this. So it's OK, just like it's OK to use thing language, because otherwise you can't express yourself. It's OK to use this abstraction, as long as you keep in mind that it's an abstraction. And it will give you approximately the right results, qualitatively the right results, even if you don't torture yourself with this. So that's why the review, of course, is called pointless geometry. It has no points. And it has no point because you, can, you might as well use. Um, and this is sort of the end of the publishing history in that field. Uh, <laughs> people lost interest. But from, if you're interested in metaphysics and ontology, it's actually quite interesting to think about this. So functions, point-to-point uh, -point mappings are homeomorphic. I, I told you that. So, and this is the last slide. Why should we care about this? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I think. I think it's interesting. Uh, I got into this completely accidentally. So, but you know, it's it's interesting because it makes uh, it gives us a clear picture of what change is. Okay, change is represented by the flow of a, of a system, and it is a fundamental first order property of all dynamical systems. Change or flow is represented by a diachronic mapping forward in time. It always extends over time. You cannot reduce it to a single instant. Newton does not resolve Zeno's paradox. It's always nice to show Newton wrong. Um, change is extended in time and always occur occurs over finite time intervals. Just to drive this point home, there are no instants. Instants are not real. In practice, we can often approximate pointless geometry and atomless space-time with point-to-point -point mapping. So it doesn't practically really matter, but it does, well, it does matter because it gives us a new and more solid foundation 
for process philosophy. So if somebody comes and bothers you and saying, you don't know what a process is, I can say, look, I have a very complicated, I have three very complicated arguments uh, that process is fundamental. And I uh, know what the process and what changes to the point where I can say it's a mapping through time. Now, if you, you're going to ask me what a mapping through time is, um, we'll discuss that over beers. I have no idea <laughs> what, what that is. Maybe, but that, that's probably not a question that makes any sense. Because if we ask the question what that mapping is, we're thinking about it as a thing again, right? Instead of as a relation between different intervals of time. So it, it could provide us with a new way of thinking about um, different time scales in the dynamics of complex systems because complex systems are exactly characterized by uh, a, a large variety of time scales. And this, uh, they may be important to understand living systems. And this is sort of the next step once this is written up that I would like to take to, to uh, look at the particular um, class of dynamical systems that are organisms. Okay, so I'm very interested at the moment, and this is more towards the main uh, scientific work that I'm doing, what the limits of dynamical systems theory are. Um, and organisms are a very big cha uh, challenge to that. And so this could be helpful in getting, getting a mathematical formalism that truly deals uh, with this constantly changing structure of living system that Giuseppe Longo uh, at the NS across the river calls extended criticality, a, a concept that I didn't understand before. I don't understand it now, but I think uh, I understand it. I, I, I think it, it may make some sense. So, so this is something that I um, want to look at in the future. Okay, so to wrap up, um, it's my favorite XKCD comic ever. And, you know, if you, if you hover over it with the mouse, it says the prosecution calls Gottfried Leibniz, but that, as you know now, won't solve this problem at all. This is, uh, it, I have to write, uh, uh, to the artist who draws this and, and tell him that. Um, it's actually wrong. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope I didn't confuse or bore you. Well, I hope I confused you a little, but I didn't bore you. Uh, I want to point out that absolutely nobody would provide any financial support for a, for a project like this. And I would like to thank and apologize uh, to James DeFusco and Nick Monk uh, uh, for any sort of mistakes and misrepresentations that I may have made. Thank you very much.